5-3, Headland. 5-3, Headland. Headland, 5-3. 5-3, the Redmont gang's working just south of shore. If you give them a couple of good blasts as you're approaching, please. Roger, roger, will do. single track rail line runs for 426 kilometers through mountainous and desert regions in the far northwest of Australia. It is maintained by men like Yonchi Todorovsky, a Yugoslav track laborer who has worked on this line for 11 years. Janos Rablewski is a Polish-born ganger returning to the isolated railway camp at Redmond after four weeks holiday in Southeast Asia. Jerry Kovacevic is also Yugoslav. He started on the line as a temporary labourer nine years ago and is now foreman of the Redmond gang. Yeah, Roger, call him approach 274.2. There are a whole range of guys that uh, come and live and work at Redmond. They must have one thing in common, they must like the kind of isolation that there is. can be a fairly lonely life. There are people that stay for uh, five to ten years, other people that stay only six months. The hard core of long-term workers on the maintenance gang has come from the Yugoslav community. Yonchi is the epitome of the traditional Yugoslav employee speaks very little English, doesn't socialise outside of other Yugoslavs in the camp, and will probably retire here quite a happy man. The workers' camp at Redmond is like a tiny oasis in this northwest desert country, the only settlement along the 426 kilometres of railway track. This is the third time I come back from holidays from Thailand and Philippines. And I don't like it here, because it's sort of coming back from paradise into a hellhole. About a year and a half, two years ago, since I started traveling overseas, I go straight over, blow it all, come back on break. But I've got to get out of this joint. The Redmond camp is about 120 kilometres from Marble Bar, one of the most remote towns in Australia and famous for registering the highest temperatures on the continent. The line was built to carry iron ore mined at Mount Whaleback, a huge open pit mine operated by the Mount Newman Mining Company. Three diesel locomotives haul a train of ore cars stretching up to two kilometers in length. Each train carries 18,000 tons of ore, 10 times a day, seven days a week through to Port Hedland. The presence of this single mine has led to the transformation of Hedland from a minor port in an isolated region to a major industrial centre.
typically there are about 80 people permanently based at Redmond. There's been three closures out of four camps, so that Redmond is the last camp along the line. There's been a merging of gangs, and there's been a merging of societies, because each camp had its own society. In your own small world here, you're not really aware of what's happening outside you. We have had a few people over the years that come up, and within a couple of weeks they just can't handle it. The isolation just gets them, and they pull, pull it in and go. They thought it's a nice and easy job, glory, glory, but once they get out the track, they start swinging a hammer. You can sort out the men from the boys. When the line was beginning to be maintained, a certain work ethic was required to live out here in the isolation, and uh, there has been a fairly long Yugoslav tradition here on the line. Many of the men have wives and relatives back in the homeland, and uh, they support those people from Australia. Good morning, Alan. 171.5. I'd like to put man on track. We don't need more. What? I just leave it there. It's like an oven, especially when you work in the cuttings. When you walk out, I mean, you're just soaked. Have a pair of shorts and you can just see the layers that I've been sweating because all the salt marks just on all the shorts. It is little consolation for the men to know that they carry on a great tradition. The building and maintenance of railways in outback Australia have always caused extreme physical hardship. The two outstanding achievements in the history of Australian railways are the line built across the Nullarbor Plain from 1912 to 1917 and the line from Port Augusta to Alice Springs, completed in 1929. On the Nullarbor Line, they built the world's longest stretch of straight railway track. With the youngest and most physically fit men drawn to the war in Europe, it was sometimes difficult to find workers. Yet in the heat and harsh conditions, these men broke world records for their speed in track laying. Quarrying rock for ballast was one of the more demanding jobs. One of those still here to remember is Bill Crow. Well, I went there to work and uh, I was put off the train at 8 o'clock at night and I lived in a tent. Oh, God, I'll never forget it. Magpies and crows and goats used to come there and pinch out a bit of fruit and all that. But anyhow, I was sent down in the pit. Oh, it was terrible. The blazing sun pelting down in this great big heap of gravel with big rocks and stones of all sizes and shapes, and we had to shovel it into trucks. It was fairly hot in the Nullarbor. Instead of having a mouthful of water, they'd drink a big pannikin full, you know, and then they'd be sick, make them vomit, make them weak, give them diarrhea. As a boy, Mick Williams worked as a water joey, carrying water to the thirsty men. The usual, uh, the old hands, 
they go and have just a sip and rinse their mouth out. And that was it. We had a half hour, say three quarters of an hour later, they'd come back and have another one. And these other guys, the strangers, new chums, they'd come in and have a full pannikin full. Uh, no good to them. Oh, terrible. Uh, sometimes it'd be 122 degrees. And once it went up to 124 for a full week. And they could hardly work because they had to use cloth to pick up the tools. They were like fire. Baby Norabija is the daughter of an Afghan camel driver who worked on the Port Augusta to Alice Springs line, eventually to be known as the Gang, in honor of these men. Charlie Dadler is now retired in Outback Mari, a township on the original Gan line. His father's camel teams helped build the line, and Charlie later ran his own camels. When I started working first driving camels, and that I was only getting a pound a week, supposed to have been getting a pound a week, we got nothing a week. <laughs> My father came from uh, Karachi, he said he did anyway. That was that in Pakistan somewhere, isn't it? And uh, I don't know what year it was, in the 1880s or 1890s, somewhere like that. They brought them out to drive the camels way. It was very hard work. You had to load them up every morning and unload them every night. The same thing every day. <laughs> The building of railways played an important part in opening up outback areas of Australia. They carried food, livestock and equipment to remote places and eventually replaced the camel trains. But most importantly, they changed the social patterns of outback Australians. The railways created lifelines between communities in far-flung places and people who lived in the outback would no longer feel so isolated by distance. They got off the train at uh, Cook to have a look around and and all they could see out, out of there was nothing, you know. So this Yank said to his mates, I've heard the Aussies talk a lot about sweet, but this is the first time I've ever seen it. <laughs> Railways today play a different role in opening up remote areas. This is a private railway, and it carries iron ore, not people. For many years, the Mount Newman rail line had difficulty in recruiting labor for maintenance gangs. Only migrants seemed prepared to suffer the extreme hardships and isolation of the Northwest, and in particular, the Yugoslavs. I came here about nine years ago. Uh, track labourer. I did that for about uh, six, seven months. Every night when I go back to my room, I just look at my hands, you know, all blisters and all that. And uh, what I said to myself, well, you know, if I think I'm going to stay here longer, you know, I'm going to get better job than what I'm doing now. When I started, uh, I thought I'm going to stay for about two, three months until I make few quid and I'll go back to city and still here. Rascal, how about my old Jerry? I was born in Yugoslavia and 1972 came to Perth and started work in the factory. Couldn't say a word of English. It was very hard. Uh, the second day, I just picked my shirt up and was walking off, you know, and the boss was chasing me, you know. I just told him I'm going home, you know. Yeah, Roger, Roger, Russell, I'll see you when you get in. Velik Lazarov, like so many others at the camp, came strictly for the money. Velik's a recent addition to the camp, relatively recent. He constantly wants to learn, and uh, being young has a tremendous amount of energy. Velik had worked as a labourer on the track maintenance gang for two years, but became dissatisfied with the monotony of the work. 
Although he still works on the line, his ambition led him to ask for some mechanical experience in the workshop. You better get these holes to spray first. Yeah. Right. When I first year, they used to call them Bulga, which is, I suppose, it's short for Bulgaria. Just recently, um, he got made an Australian citizen, and uh, when that happened, we called him Skippy, because he's now Australian, you see. Uh, I come, come out from Bulgaria is very uh, funny because I heard it from one guy on the west is very good, you know. That is the correct, you know. And I haven't seen before the west, you know. I just heard, it. I just dreaming, you know. I haven't been there, no way. Because I grew up with my father and my mother 26 years. I never, I never lived separate with them, you know. We building all the by, uh, wife together, you know. I help him, he help me, and uh, and when I I go from my country, and my father when he write me, he say. I think she, this is the dream, you know. He never believed. When I, I give call from Austria, he say, I can't believe it, that, you know. And he say, you have to go back to, to Bulgaria, you know. I say, yes, yes, I come, you know. And uh, because i scared to go back to my country, I say, yes, I come back, no worries. You don't worry for that, you know. And when I come up here and I give call again, and he say, Jesus Christ, where you, where you, you go, you know? Because the Australia is too far away from Europe, you know? It's so hard for me up here too, because I have to build uh, my life from beginning, you know? I have to start from nothing. Uh, what can I do? This is the life. Save up enough now and just piss off for me. It's the only thing for me. The day I was earning, I used to uh, sit back, play poker, to drop 800 to 1,000 to two grand a night was peanuts. Everything I earned, I just blew it on piss and gambling. Some of the blokes that are still sort of around, like say Booger, for example, saves every little cracker. He's only been two and a half years. He's fairly close to already paid his house off. So there's blokes like him that are fairly smart. They sit here for three, four years. They don't gamble, they don't drink. But sort of, you know, you've got to do it. Me, I've lived before, I thought I'd live here. And it's just that money comes, money blows. I was born in Poland, come out here, 59, I used to go at my grandmother's place where I lived. Oh, I could go there to Poland today and pick the same flat, but with parents and everyone were there, the street, the park, go and see my aunties, still sort of remember them, but uh, with all the solidarity and everything going on, the martial law. Most probably I'll be one of the type that uh, get on the old Polish vodka then. Before I know it, I'll be locked up. I'll be doing uh, six or 60 years in the bloody salt mines in Russia. No one would see me again.
tried to get a job in the city, but I couldn't get one because most of the people that like to stay in the city and all the jobs been taken are going to stay and keep this job probably the next 10 years, I suppose. You had to take whatever you could get, sir. Things were fairly tough them days for work. You'd see blokes, you know, office workers come out there, you know, on the shovel and pick, hands would all blister up. You felt sorry for them and all that sort of thing. But nothing you do about it if they, well, they had to see it out. Some of these fellas were broken down doctors, they were broken down editors of papers and things like that. But mind you, some of them were victims of circumstances and were glad to go to work because there was no dole in those days and they had to get uh, food by ration tickets. They'd get a ticket to get a bit of meat and a ticket to get this, that and the other. But that didn't happen to those out in the fettling jobs. Trouble is, a lot of them got out there and they got that heavily in debt that they just couldn't leave it. They were there for years and years. See, they didn't have any trade. And just working on the railways was something that anybody could do, really. And they had their own cottages, and they had their own bedrooms, they had a cook who cooked their meals for them, and they got their full pay every payday. They saved up a lot, and what they really wanted to do, after two or three years, they went back to where they came from. Yonchi Todorovsky has been working and saving for 11 years to support his wife and four children in Yugoslavia. He would like to go back, but fears he could not get such a well-paid job at home. He has not seen his family for four years. In Australia, not the Kids, you know, they used to miss you. They'd come home and swamp all over you. One would want to comb your hair, <laughs> change your shoes, put your slippers on, and. Yes, it was, uh, yeah, didn't realise it until the kids started to grow up, you know. Uh, I think that's what uh, upset my wife, you know. She took to the sherry flag and uh, I stuck it out. Stuck it out till my health, failed, well, our home broke up and my health failed, I had a nervous breakdown and, uh, you know, blood pressure because I drank a lot of plonk then. Wear black and blue, you so you'd get off the job as soon as you could. But uh, you didn't get off, you stopped on it, you know. To be married and to live separate, I don't like that. I'd be married, and when I come up here, I, I haven't got a chance to bring my missus up here. And uh, we split it, you know. She has to marry it up there, I have to find some a woman up here. It's so hard to bring it, my missus up here. So hard. And I think it's, it's not very good to live separate when you're married. My ex-missus come over for a couple of weeks over here. Oh, it was good. I suppose could have got back together, but uh, once bitten, twice shy, I suppose. I don't think it sort of would work out between me and her. She's got her own life and I've sort of got a different idea now. I suppose I'll bump into a bird somewhere along the line that's uh, for my style and liking. I don't know. I've been here so long and I said uh, to myself, well, this doesn't lead to nowhere, you know. I better settle down. So I got married back home. But it's very hard because she has to stay at Headland and I got to come back here at Redmond.
social life over here is not much good. We can go every second weekend, fly back Monday morning, and really you can't sort of get yourself a girlfriend or anything because you're two weeks here, and it's very, very hard socialising. I'd love to go and pack up and just go, but uh, finances are a little bit low on me, so I can't go anywhere. <laughs> I like to be in the city if I can get the job because in the city you can have good time, not like here, just from work you go in bed, from bed work, that's all you do. To live in isolation as we call it, um, you've got to be a pretty level-headed sort of guy, a person that doesn't fret easy or get upset easy and it's got to be able to handle boredom. Um, the job does get pretty repetitious, but it's not so much that, it's when you finish work at the end of the day, because you're not in Port Hedland or Newman or Abe Town, you haven't got the other avenues, you're locked into the wet canteen or the video room or the TV. To begin serving an 18-month prison sentence for income tax evasion, a district... We have had a few in years gone by who've finished up nearly having a nervous breakdown because they've come in, they've wanted to save that money, although they hated the place because of the isolation, they couldn't hack it, and eventually it got them down mentally. Not, nobody finished up in the funny farm, but you could see it happening with the guys over a period of time. Because they've been living in isolation, they tend to lose communication with the outside world. When they do go to Perth or wherever, they feel out of place because they've sort of lost track of the normal type day-to-day -day conversation, and they've lost that art of communication. The only thing sort of keep you sane over here, you just hit the bar every night, just get yourself obliviated. Next day you just float off to work. Do your thing and the days go really fast, like weeks fly then, but if you sort of sit straight sober, poor. this nice day and a nice evening and we decide that we'd have a dance. Righto. We get some of the kids to get out with an old cowbell, square old metal thing they used to run up and down and sing out, dance tonight, dance tonight, Bill Crow's the MC, Tom Crow's playing the mouth organ, Mrs Jennings is on the piano, bring a plate, everybody. This is the way they were singing out up and down the street. And in half an hour we'd have a dance in progress and we'd dance all night. A month or two, everyone, you know, knew one another, friendly and Sit around a big sleeper fire of a night talking, having a yarn, boil the billy, a few biscuits. If you're lucky, you had a wireless. Uh, if you was unlucky, didn't have enough money, didn't have a wireless. So. Well, every Afghan had a different instrument. Some would play the old original Afghan songs. They'd always have a big tin dish. And, you know, and they played the tune to the song on that dish. The night prayers, the priest would call that, you know, you could hear it about a mile off. That was very, you know, good to listen to every night. I born in Bulgaria, you know. I still like my country, you know, because I born there, I grow there, I have parents up there, and I still like my country, you know. I know for the mother is father is very hard. We can't see each other anymore, you know. When I ring up to the telephone, I can't talking with them. There's, when I grab the the phone, 
and then straight away start to cry. See, I go in for heaven, I buy 50 dollars for 25 minutes, and for 25 minutes I can't say nothing. And I come back up here, I write one letter, I say, if next time start to cry like first time, I never make telephone call again. Because I pay money for that, you know, to just to talking. I know because you're sick for me, you know, I'm sick too. I think it's uh, so hard to live separate, you know. Six kilometers of rail between Mount Newman and Port Hedland is a continuous welded track. The constant pounding of the loaded ore cars creates brutal forces on the rail, and the extremes of heat and cold can cause the steel to snap. Each day, the Redmont gang has to check the line for a hundred kilometers in each direction from the camp, for any cracks or damage to the track could cause a derailment. have to run the length every morning on either side of their camp. They'd have 40 miles to contend with. Due to the ex extensive heat in the daytime, the roads used to get hot, and the navvies used to say that the line spoke to them. It used to crack and move. It used to move as much as seven inches to the east or the west. Ah, oh, well, if the settlers didn't do their job, the trains wouldn't be run because of some of the rails break, you know, the rails, they sell. Cold weather, they break a lot in the cold weather. Real cold weather, the, the steel rails snap, snap like, just snap. Yes, yes. I well. thought it must be a break because it was very cold during the night. Well, it's not a bad one. It's only be a 10 mil gap, straight break, get the gang down, we're just gonna drill and bolt it and lift the restriction back to normal. camps uh, had a lot of people in them that were wanted by police and they used to come out into these isolated areas uh, to get away but uh, the policeman at uh, Tarkula told me one day that he knew every crim that was uh, out on the trans line and I said well are they going to leave them there or what he said no we'll just leave them there till we want them. Yeah there was a few fights around us only amongst the uh, like not amongst the uh, the palms, Irishmen or the Australians, that amongst the mainly amongst the Greeks, no Italians. They have a few scraps. But then there was a big bloke there by the name of Mick Blood, great big man. He was in charge of the quarry. He'd break that up. You go and get them and bash their heads together. So he stopped the fights. Well, I can remember one night when Jack was sent up to Beresford with a police officer because of a disturbance up there. 
where the ganger had uh, already shot two of the fettlers and was on a real bad, went berserk and was really bad. This man was inside the cottages, but uh, they just walked straight in. I suppose he expected them, and they took the rifle off me and expected the two bodies that he shot, and they had to convey those bodies back to Port Augusta. Well, you can understand a man living alone, cooking his own food and being isolated in a God-forgotten place where the crows fly backwards and all that sort of thing, you know. It's a terrible trying time. Their life wasn't happy. Redmond is such a different community and such a close-knit community that anybody who doesn't fit into Redmond very soon comes to people's attention. Very quickly, the person either recognises that he doesn't fit into the community or he's told that he doesn't fit in and uh, the, the person leaves. You get some people, you know, getting on booze and miss the other day of work, you know, stay in the cab, nothing to do, you know, get bored, start smashing the windows and all that. When the other uh, workmates get back to Redmond and uh, get argue with them and all that, and that's where it starts. We told the guys if they want to fight, as long as they get out of the boundary lease of the, of the company's sort of premises and they can go for their life. And um, then uh, the ones that wins, or the best one wins, that come back and tell us uh, where the body is and we can't pick them up. So uh, that seems to be work fairly well and uh, keep the guys under control. People tend to congregate, and the Yugoslavs in particular have got together in their own group and uh, they've been a very close-knit uh, little community within Redmond. They rather be together most of the times and talk their language and uh, they don't bother sort of to mix with other people. I think that's sort of an interest, you know, if you're interested in to, le to learn something, you're going to mix it with other people, you know, to pick up a few words and all that, but they're not. For example, the Yontin, Costa, uh, well, they've been much longer here in Australia than myself, and uh, I've been working with them quite a few years, and what I told of them, they not really interesting about the language at all, you know? They're interesting about the money. Redmond gang, before I come in, every single fellow there was a Yugoslav. We used to re-rail and do things with him, like together as two gangs. And they'd be all talking Yugoslav, and we'd be all talking English, and there was a big communication breakdown, like they'd be telling all the blacks, do this, do this, and they'd be saying in Yugoslav. And we'd be saying to blacks, do this and do this in English. Like you got that bald-headed Todorovsky on the job, telling him, do this and do that, and he looks around. He can't understand. But he's a top worker, he's the number one worker. But he looks at the other blokes and the other blokes that understand they've got to explain to him in Yugoslav. Most of the Yugos, they sort of keep to themselves this few that sort of mix with us. The other ones, they just want to sit and they just talk Yugoslav, nothing else. Costa and Yonche, they've been 17 or 18 years this country. I don't think can learn this language forever. So I must talk to them Yugoslav. Some people get very upset, but it's not my fault. People can't understand the language, so you have to help him on the job. Generally, these people will sit back. They don't want to be seen to be 
making decisions because they've got some attitude about frightened of making a mistake. Just don't want to be involved or don't want to be held responsible rather than be involved. Just don't want to be responsible. There are great pressures on those who do take responsibility for work on the line. For when something does go wrong, the results can be disastrous. My first week, actually, I got woken up at 3 o'clock in the morning with a phone call from train control to say they want all your bulldozers, etc., down at the 30 kilometres without a major derailment. When we got down there, it was one of the biggest messes I've seen for a number of years. Jovan Ruic was a foreman on the line at the time of a derailment back in 1975. A memorial was erected by friends in the grounds of Redmond Camp. What he did, uh, he left the responsibility to the Genga to finish off the job, and uh, apparently he didn't uh, do it properly, and uh, which uh, caused the derailment. So, as he was good work and all that, and very honest person, he couldn't stand, you know, to wait for the boss here and tell him, you know, what's happened. And uh, what happened in the morning, everybody heard, you know, a big explosion. Apparently what he did, uh, took a bit box, one box of explosive and all that, sit on and blew himself up. And, uh, you know, we tried to find him, you know, it was very hard. person relies on another, from a ganger to a locomotive driver to a train controller, you have to lean on one another because without one another you cannot have this safe operation. The gang work is vital to us. drivers were all very, very considerate towards the navvies, and if they found a bump along the road, well, I did. If ever I found a bump along the road, I thought there was a cracked rail or something of that nature. I'd throw a little piece of coal and I'd wrap a, a train order around it and throw it off and say, there's a bump in the road at the 878 or wherever it happened to be, the mileage, at four telegraph poles away, east or west. And they used to go out and fix that, and they were very grateful for that too. They're the foundation of the railway, and they're the most neglected man in the universe for the nature of work that they do. It's a very, very hard job. Up until about five years ago, the process of maintenance here was continual. Every day, you'd be out doing basically the same task. In the last five years, there has been a move towards removing manual uh, methods off the line and that has resulted in new technology being implemented on the railway. Well Bill, what sort of uh, defects have uh, you reported so far? Well we got uh Severity uh, 3 on the surface, right just back there. We've got a few miles I think the machine uh, will have an effect uh, with the gain. Uh, Even now, it, I, can, I can assure you that it has got some effect. 
because with the machine that she can tune to very fine art and she can pick up a very minor severity rating, there is no way in the eyes of any human being that we'd be able to pick up a severity three rating. I'm purely speaking about track faults. But with the recorder, yes, it can. The new technology that we're using have done away with a lot of the manual labouring work, but there'll always be a need to have uh, you guys swinging your hammers because to bring a million dollar machine 200 kilometres to do a five minute job is not very economical. You've got to have somebody out there on that track. The type of work is changing and uh, so we're demanding that the people that are employed have some background in uh, mechanised skill. There are very few left on the railway now that uh, actually need brute strength to do work, but essentially we're looking for a more skilled kind of person. To be a track foreman now, it's much, much different than what it used to be four or five years ago. Today, most of my job is involved in the paperwork. In the past, we had four line camps, and very shortly we're going to end up with one, which is Redmond. And uh, I believe if the company is going to reduce the manning, I wouldn't be surprised if Redmond goes in the next few years. This is not total living really, is it? You know, you just wake up and go to work and come back to your room. Uh, it's monotonous. Within a year in a place like this, that's the maximum time you can sort of give of yourself. It's not really a, a life for a single break, really. Actually, all you're doing is you're just wasting time and wasting years. These days, I like to do a lot of things, but eventually, just as long as I've got a house, something super nice around Perth or Sydney, somewhere near a beach, a few kids running around, top misses. But on the other hand, I might turn around and go to the Philippines, buy myself a bar. See, I'm sort of up and down. i still got a few years. I might as well try out. I'll go back to them, I suppose. I stay for the money up here, you know? I'm not saved bloody for nothing. I want to buy my house off and save a little bit money. I want to bring my father and my mother up here, you know? I want, when they come, I want to show them what I'm doing for that time, you know? And when my father and my mother up here, to be happy. I have to stay up here because I have to make something for the future, you know?